What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Steven Ostentoski here of the Maze and Blue Review, bringing you another episode here of the Maze and Blue Film Review. Today, I'm joined by none other than Thomas Gwines, former Michigan offensive lineman, University of Michigan offensive lineman here on the film here. You, I've always done these solo, always been looking for someone to assist, make me look smart here on my analysis. You can find Thomas Gwines frequently on WTKA. Happy enough to have him here sharing his analysis chops here on uh on michigan.rivals.com welcome thomas how's it going welcome to the hey. to the video no appreciate you uh definitely uh, happy to be here excited about this new opportunity definitely excited to work with you in this particular platform this forum i think uh we're definitely going to delve into the deep end of the pool and give our viewers a unique and interesting look to hopefully open up their eyes to look at the game from a different lens. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Happy to have you here. Breaking down a handful of Penn State plays here. As we get more comfortable, we'll be doing more and more, hopefully, as the season progresses. I know we don't have that many games left, but hopefully we'll have you know a lot more into this championship season here. So before we get into a couple plays here, any brief thoughts you had from the Michigan victory over the Nittany Lions this past weekend? Um, definitely proud of the boys. Um, Happy Valley is a, a difficult place to play. I really like how this team has responded on the road, going into some adverse environments. Camp Randall with Wisconsin coming out with a W. Obviously, uh, playing over in East Lansing is definitely a difficult time. Uh, fell a little bit short in that game. But, you know, the boys are showing a high level of, of resiliency and perseverance right now. So um, I'm happy. Um, there are some things that we still need to clean up. We still have some uh, some issues going on, but overall, you know, I'm definitely pleased, especially, you know, how we have performed over the past couple of years. I definitely feel like we're on the right track. Absolutely. The road game mentality, you love to see it. You'll take that 21-17 game any day of the week coming out of Happy Valley there. All right, let's dive in. we got a couple positive plays, a few negatives to go through, hash out. Let's get right into it here. They run away from those receivers and look. Second and six, nice bounce outside here. Thomas, what happened here? Seems like maybe a misalignment, but uh, just a nice pickup, easy pickup for Penn State. A little too easy, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely going out of the uh, first quarter here. You know, would love to have gotten a, uh, a stop here going into the second quarter. But as you look here, when you watch Hutch at the top of your screen on your defensive left, offensive right, number 97, Hutch starts with an outside move to kind of get the uh, right tackle to open up his shoulders, then comes back with a counter move inside with a rip technique. Now, where this play gets lost at, because if you look down at the bottom of the screen, we have quads left, if you will. We have four offensive players lined up to the left side or to the um, wide side of the field. To the boundary, we are open. So what does that mean? We have to continue to keep outside contain if Hutchinson goes inside I'm guessing I don't know what the defense was but I'm guessing that 41 the linebacker here um on the left side should have been scraping to the outside to help keep contain or the safety should have been walked up even further because it after you let the play play you'll see where um as the ball bounces outside there's nobody there absolutely nobody 41 gets a little bit caught up in the uh, ball handling in the backfield. And he's peeking in the backfield instead of keeping uh, lane discipline. And like I said, we're, we're speculating, but based off of the alignment and, and what the uh, what Hutch is doing right here, I would venture to say either the safety was too far back or the linebacker got caught up with the uh, backfield motion and instead of scraping, came up into the line of scrimmage, leaving outside contain completely open. Yeah, I think that's a great point because he gets lost in the wash. 41 does a little bit, right? He, he lets himself a little bit too. He doesn't give himself, he doesn't make it easy on himself to bounce out if he does have that responsibility. And you mentioned, I think it's a little bit late on uh, Vince Gray here. He's playing over the top. And, and I don't see any reason for him to be that deep given there are no right. wide receivers on that side. So I, I agree, it's, it could be either one of those things. I would say there's a possibility because you have this double team here that you have 41, he's necessary for this, this A gap in case there's any sort of cutback lane. But I do think you, you make a really great point of it seems like he, 
he doesn't make it easy on himself coming up as far as he does. He actually makes contact with the offensive line when if he, you know, only comes up a yard maybe, then he's in a much better position because he does make the play here. Like, it's a good job later on to scrape, choose an angle there, and eventually track down the play. But uh, with how late Vincent Gray over the top near the hashes there is triggering on this play, you're right because it seems very deliberate from Hutchinson, right? Like, that doesn't seem like he just decides to do that. Um, right. It seems like there's there's something missed there. So yeah, it's it's unfortunate because I I would bet that it, it's both. You mentioned both possibilities. It's a great call out that you know we really don't know what is called here, but I think it's both uh, Nikai Hill Green coming too far forward and possibly alignment a little bit too deep, not recognizing the possibility of a bounce here. And if you mitigate either one of those things, right, he doesn't come that far up or he lines up a little bit closer, maybe right here, you cut this down for, you know, two yard gain instead of a, an eight yard gain. Exactly. And so my biggest concern here is, is that that's kind of been a, a point of contention throughout the year. Um, when you find that we've gotten re uh, relative to big runs against us, it's been up the middle. Mm hmm. And or it's because we have lost outside contain at some particular point. There's been some sort of bubble screen. Our second uh, secondary is unable to get off the blocks of the wide receivers. Or it's a situation like this where somebody takes a poor route. Um, there's a missed assignment somewhere. And basically the gate was left wide open for a nice pickup here for the Nittany Lions. Yeah. And, and final, final question I have for you, Thomas. Is this a hold? I know you're a former offensive lineman. <laughs> Maybe you'll side with the Nittany Lions on this one. Does 79, I think that's got to be called, right? It seems like he's hooking that arm, the inside rip move. So, yeah. And, and I think to, to answer your question, I would say yes. Yeah. But now playing devil's advocate, as you, from a referee's perspective, from a, a line judge or, or, or back judge, because uh, Hush is doing the rip move, I think that kind of mitigates him being looked upon as the tackle was actually turning his shoulders mm. because as he's coming through and basically their arms hook up. But yeah, I would definitely concur that, you know, I would probably call that a hold. Um, the tackle takes a poor set, doesn't get his hands inside. Um, he was struggling all day with his punch with Hutch. Hutch was giving him the business throughout <laughs> the game. So, um, yeah, he might have saved himself know. here by not grabbing onto the numbers. You know, you mentioned right. like he misses the punch, but he doesn't grab there. So right. maybe that saved him a little bit. I'm of the mindset. There's probably some holding on every given play. It's just a matter of how egregious. Um, so, yeah, I will call that one a, a, a be careful for 79 moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely you're skating on thin ice, son. Get your hands inside. <laughs> It's completely miscommunication. Uh, Mike Yersich, the coordinator in the background. Here comes Hutchinson. He knocks the ball free. Hutchinson, huge strip sack here, third and 11. Talk us through it, Thomas. What happened here? What uh, what did Penn State do wrong? What did Michigan do right to force a big turn, or almost turnover, but a uh, strip sack here? You know what was really, at least in my mind, pivotal, pivotal, pivotal about this uh, particular play was Michigan hadn't gotten a first down yet. We didn't get our first first down into the second uh, quarter. Yeah. So it was imperative for us to, for our defense, to get off the field, to get these guys rested. That was one of my major concerns as this game went on, was our defense was on the field too long. And as that game got to the state that it was, that we knew it was going to be a close game, I wanted our defense to be as fresh as possible if it came down to them. Um, holding off the Nittany Lions to hold on to the win. Sure. Um, when you watch the Penn State's right tackle takes the, takes his set, it's not a bad set, but look at his hand placement. As low as they are and as quick and as long as Hutchinson is, right now you have a three-way go. Hutch decides to go with the bull rush right here upon initial contact. So now when you look at, if you pause it right there, when you look at the right tackle upon contact, where's his head? Everything is, you know, facing forward. He's overextended. He's already lost the battle. The only his only saving grace right now is is if he's a good enough athlete to regain his feet and to take his left hand to get it on Hutch's right hip. 
if he gets his hand on Hutch's right hip and kicks his hips out far enough, which displaces his center of gravity, it's a, it makes it easier to run him around the horn, if you will. But because Hutch does such a good job with his hands and he's, and he's you know, a super strong kid, uh, utilizes his length very well, and he's, you know, very quick, this now becomes, you know, a monumental task for this right tackle. So right tackle gets out of position off rip. Hutch, one of the great things about him is, is his motor. So even though he makes the move, he's beating the tackle, and he's getting ran up, ran around the horn, quarterback steps up, good pocket to step up in. Hutch with that relentless motor comes up to make the uh, strip sack here. Um, unfortunately, or, you know, lucky enough for, for the Nittany Lions, unfortunate for the Wolverines, they were actually able to come up with the uh, fumble. But, you know, just this right here is a great example of pass rush coming in, getting contact, and then shedding the blocker. Now, obviously, Hutch would have wanted to have taken that to shorten that corner a little bit, but because of the fact that we did a good job in the secondary, there was nobody for the quarterback to get uh, rid of the ball too. Now he's got to look, gives Hutch an extra uh, couple of seconds to get off the block and finish his pursuit of the quarterback. Yeah, and, and you mentioned getting, just getting him uncomfortable. Clifford was uncomfortable all day. And, and as soon as you get this pressure, you, you mentioned, uh, as soon as he gets around here, you force Clifford to step up. Now he's out of rhythm. Now he's not comfortable. He can't really get through his reads. His reads are sped up. And I think throughout right. the course of this game, you saw Clifford really resort to just speeding up his reads because of plays like this, right? You go through this enough and, and you're going to be uh, a little gun shy and expecting pressure to come maybe even on plays where it isn't there. Um, well, and that's, yeah, I'm go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 you're good. I was just going to say that's one of the, the huge things about playing offensive line and being able to pass block well, as far as establishing that level of trust with your quarterback that your quarterback has a has that level of trust. My guys up front are going to take care of me and it allows me to do the things that I need to do to go through my progression and and mechanics to make sure that I'm getting the ball off properly, but also that I'm getting it off on time into the proper location. As you as you alluded to and to your point, when you have a quarterback that seemingly is a little bit sketchy about really putting that level of trust in, in, in his offensive line things kind of go, you know, from bad to worse, so to speak. Uh, when you're starting to speed up your progression, your your mechanics are starting to fail, and then you start throwing those errant passes or, or those incomplete passes, or you're getting the ball picked off. So, no, that definitely speaks volumes to what you were speaking to about making that quarterback uncomfortable. Even if we don't get the sack, us making him uncomfortable is going to pay dividends for us later on in the game. Yeah, and one specific aspect of this play, it seems like there's a failed stunt going on on the other side because you have uh, you have Upshaw here crossing this way, and Ojabo just doesn't really seem like he knows what's happening. So on the other side of the, of the defensive line, besides Hutchinson, it's really well protected, right? Like Ojabo's not really getting any penetration. Seems like uh, Upshaw was expecting some sort of stunt there. So without Hutchinson there. He doesn't have to bug out at all, right? And, and no, really good job from the running back as well in pass protection. Right. So that's all. That's all Hutchinson forcing this play. That was a great blitz pickup by number ten. And yeah, to your point, there definitely seemed to be some level of miscommunication, or um, based off of almost the read-like technique hmm. that uh, fifty-five is taking right now. Maybe he was a spy and was going to drop late, and when he saw that. The stunt was supposed to take place. Hutch gets gets pressure. And so as the quarterback now starts to roll out to the his left or right, yeah. that you know, maybe he's calling off the stunt because now I want to keep contained. So we don't have the situation that we had versus the last play that we broke down. Yeah. So again, I'm just hypothesizing on this at this particular point, not knowing what the exact play call is, but based off the body language and, and the angles thereof, um, that's just one uh, possible reason why we're seeing what we're seeing on the defensive right. Right. And the final aspect here seems like Michigan is adjusting late. There's some communication between linebacker Nikai Hill Green and Brad Hawkins here. So you obviously have the crossing route from the tight end here but late you're going to see a dig route um 
coming around from the uh, the outside wide receiver number three into frame there. And because you have both Hawkins and Nikai Hill Green, you got two guys on the tight end there. If Hutchinson isn't forcing him out there, right? If he's continuing to read, you can see the eyes of Clifford. He's tr he's trying to see something. Like he's reading this, right. he probably recognizes. Yeah, there's a little bit of a bust here, and this guy's on an in route. Um, you're gonna have some open field here with Rod Moore. You know, he's not gonna be able to adjust that quickly to this route. So. There's a lot of elements where having a standout, you know, future first round defensive end like that, that that'll that'll solve some defensive breaks, you know, and being a third and eleven, not only is this a potential uh, turnover for Michigan, but it shuts down any possibility of of Clifford finding that break in the secondary. And that's kind of been a uh, Achilles heel, so to speak, to the last couple of games that I've noticed. Seemingly, we're, we're getting the defensive calls in a little bit later mm -hmm. um, than what we would like. And to your point, there seems to be some level of confusion. And, you know, when I'm looking at the linebacker, and, and, and I'm not sure if that's a corner safety here, but on 84, something to me says it shouldn't be two of us here. We're not bracketing this guy. So. Yeah. Where's the open guy? I'm needing one of those guys to have enough wherewithal to say to to switch it off. You know, yell out, stay on. I'm I'm bugging out, and I'm going to look for work to see what the open area is. There was a couple of times in the game where you know I got Nittany Lions wide open in this huge zone area. I'm like, why are these guys getting so free, or why are we so lost right. in 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 our coverage? So again. These are things that these last two games, I'll be real interested to see within their coaching staff if they pick up on that and try to uh, somehow capitalize on those miscues. And hopefully, you know, our coaching staff is cleaning this up to make sure that these things aren't going to rear their ugly head again in future games. Right. Well said. Born in Cameroon, came to this country when he was 12. Screen, good call. Room for Haskins. Bounces off a hit and lunges for the first down. Nice pick up here, third and 13. A little bit fortunate. Michigan gets the first down there. Haskins bounces off a guy at about eight yards. Continues on for a first down. Heck of a game from him. Thomas, talk us through this play. Well, you know, definitely Haskins was a workhorse uh, for this game. I want to say he had almost uh, at least 15 to 20 carries. Um, definitely did a, a, a heck of a job toting the rock here. Um, as we, you know, you look here on the screenplay, the screen is all about timing. And you definitely have to, you know, as you're going through in practice, you're going through that internal clock. And I remember when I used to run a screen, I used to actually count out loud, 1,001, 1,002, and, you know, 1,002 and a half at point making contact, then that's what I would go through my release and get go through my upfield progression. Hmm. Um but at the same point in time, too, it can't be a jailbreak. Right. So that's the delicate balance of, of a screen. I want to invite the defensive front seven up. I want to suck them up enough where it gets them out of position, but it can't be so um, abruptly obvious that they're on the quarterback and the running back doesn't have enough time to get out. And it, it just screws up the whole continuity of the play. Sure. So we get out here on the edge and one of my main issues this year has been our tight ends and their blocking or lack thereof. So I'm looking at 86, I believe is, is that shoemaker? Yep. Yep. That's good. Maker. So yep. if you take it back, right, right there. So as soon as shoemaker comes up and makes contact here, and if you let it play shoemaker, should be driving this guy he knows it's a screen it's coming play side even here now shoemaker has, has turned into a tackle giving a soft corner and shortening the corner for the defensive end so what i mean by that is when shoemaker's here is he should be driving him to the end zone the defender continues to work outside now it should turn into a run block to the sideline when that defender shortens shoemaker's left shoulder and starts to get around him that's when it goes back to what i was talking about earlier when hutch got the sack for the mm -hmm. offensive lineman you got to get on that hip and drive him around the horn and take him further up the field than he needs to be sure 
we get to number five here. Num- <laughs> number five takes an L, ladies and gentlemen. There's there's no real <laughs> uh, soft way of putting that. You know, he was game. He came in there. He stuck his face in there. But, uh, you know, there's something about when you have greater mass and acceleration and all of those things taking place. Um, you know, I, I give the kid a, a, a for effort, but uh, obviously he just didn't bring enough lead in his pencil to make that block. Getting to your uh, number, is that number one or four? On the outside there? Yeah, it's yeah, Andrew, the Andrew Anthony on, uh, on the yeah, corner so back there. Yeah. So again, as a young kid, and especially, you know, as Michigan has historically been known for great blocking wide receivers. So does a good enough job, stays it stays in the way enough in order to help spring Hassan. But the most disappointing part of this play and why I say it's just an a okay play is the lack of the uh, utilization of the offensive line. Mm-hmm. Big fellas, right now, I used to love running screens because it was it gave us a chance to show our, our athleticism as big guys. We weren't just knuckle draggers. We we're able to get out there and, and do some things in space. But at the same point in time, too, as a running back, you got to set me up for greatness. So if you look here, if you stop it right there, you got all of this in front. Maybe he breaks it. Maybe he doesn't. If you allow, if, if he was just to press it back here, I'm, um, I'm sorry, Hassan, if you were, if Hassan was to press it back to his right a little bit, allow these guys to get up front, and hopefully if the timing was right, he would be just fast enough if you go to that linebacker in pursuit on the top of the screen. Yeah, number 13 you're saying there. He, he's the main the guy to beat, screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So if he was able to get up in that hole where the referee is standing at, this could have been a home run play. Yeah. So, again, it goes back to talking about the timing and the delicate nature of the screen. A lot of people are just like, okay, block, 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 let the guy go, and everybody just go find somebody to go pick up. But, you know, if as a running back, if you get out there too quickly and you don't allow the big fellas to get out here to give you an escort, yeah, you may have gotten the first down, but, you know, we left a lot of hidden yardage there because the play didn't develop up as nicely as I would have liked to have seen it. Sure. Yeah, and it, it doesn't even, I don't think it really even needs to be like you hit this hole right here, but at least if you if you bubble this back a little bit, right? Bubble this back right. a little bit, just get behind these guys. That makes right. these guys think, and that makes them, they have to commit then. If you're right behind these guys or at least closer to them, they don't right. They don't go along this path. They, they are seeing these big guys flying at him and they're like, Oh crap, we got to make a decision now. And then he can either bounce back outside or he can hit that, you know, if there is a potential cutback lane, depending on how this forms in front of him. So yeah, I think that's that's a great point about setting up your blockers. You're, you're not setting yourself up for success here um, by committing to this early now being, you know, the great player he is, he's able to fend off a, relatively weak tackle attempt. I don't know what number 12 is doing there, but <laughs> but he makes it work, right? Players make plays in big time games and that's what Haskins did repeatedly. But uh, but yeah, it, it, it's interesting. The final aspect I thought about this was um, they Michigan must think that having a tight end here on the safety is more advantageous than sending the tight end on number 12 here. Um, because I gotta think maybe they're hoping that this block from the wide receiver will be more like a crack block on number 12. And this, you know, this is maybe a more important block. So you outsize the safety with your tight end. But I thought that was an interesting choice because based on alignment, it seems like the tight end could have gotten to number 12 pretty easily. But uh, obviously number five there, Sainer still not a, not the guy to take out the, the linebacker. So. Yeah. I mean, again, I loved your point when you alluded to, making the defenders bubble Mm -hmm. every block doesn't have to be a devastating block sometimes just get it in a guy's way and forcing him to make a decision either way opens up lanes for the back but the back has to be able to have a a level of patience and have vision there so one of the things in which i would probably say is a shortcoming of haskins is he's a converted linebacker to running back and when I watched this kid run, runs tough, runs hard, um, 
very north and south sort of guy. But I think a chink in his armor, if you will, is his lack of, of vision, lack of ability to use lateral movement to continue to get himself north and south. So, you know, hopefully, um, though, obviously we only got, you know, two games left and, and hopefully four or five, depending on how the playoff situation goes. But, you know, hopefully some of those things start to uh, come to fruition for him. One of the great things which I love about Blake was Blake runs very hard, but Blake has a level of shiftiness mm -hmm. to him and pull and quickness that um, I don't necessarily see Hassan bring. Hassan brings great linear uh, speed and power going north and south, and that's what that guy brings to the table. So, again, to your point, if he would have set some things up here, he could have been able to work smarter, not necessarily harder. Right. Yep. That first step right here, he steps with his left here instead. One little right. stutter right here and then this way. Because that little stutter, you know, it's one stutter to him, but to these guys, that's they, they're paused. Like they're paused for a good, you know, half second there. And that just gives a little bit more crease for for Haskins to set those up a little bit better. Yep. Great call. Yes, sir. But I, I definitely think it's imperative for our tight ends to get better on 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 blocking. Yeah. I mean, there's been several games, several plays where I'm watching these guys at the point of attack and it's you know, it's null and void. We're not getting any movement, we're getting beat. Sometimes we're getting driven back into the hole. And so as I'm watching it and to your point, I have a tight end on a safety and basically the safety's running around our tight end instead of our tight end taking him and planning him off on the sideline somewhere. Right. Yep. Good call. Transfers. Third down and 11. McNamara taken down. The ball is out. Evan Cady sacked him. And it... Brutal play. Brutal play. Penn State just went down. Scored touchdown. Got the two-point conversion. Michigan trying to answer here midway through the fourth. And just can't have this happen on third and long. And uh, just no shot. No shot for McNamara there. Talk us through, Thomas. I'm sure the uh, offensive lineman in you is uh, <laughs> is shivering at this technique here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm watching the left tackle, and if you go back to the snap of the ball, let's look at first step. So here you got a wide five. If you pause it, I'm sorry, go back to right before the ball is snapped. Sure. So let's look at the alignment. I got what we would call a wide five even to a six technique. So with a guy this wide... I want to get a little more vertical in my set as, as an offensive lineman, meaning that that left leg should be giving me more of a straight back kick in order to help cut down on the angle. So literally playing tackle, playing offensive line in general is a big game of geometry and you have to understand the angles, also understanding personnel. So on that first step, do you see where his first step was? That's he doesn't outside. gain he doesn't gain any ground on his set he basically sets underneath himself and if you let it play on that kick right there he's in decent position hands are too low but now right here if you pause it right here look at the amount of distance there still is between the defender and the tackle now he should have his shoulders more parallel to the line of scrimmage, but because of the bad first step, he's in a position now where his shoulders are now starting to become perpendicular to the line of scrimmage. And once your shoulders become perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, you're given a defensive end, a three-way go, meaning I can run around you, I can run inside you, or I can hit, a, hit you with a bull rush and run through you and put you in the lap of the quarterback. So as we let this play out, Gaining ground, gaining ground, still no punch, still no punch, still no punch. Now we're punching. But as we're punching, we're leaning with our head and we've allowed our feet to get too close together and that left hip begins to open up the, the fence post, so to speak. Thusly giving you a soft shoulder. So now I've got, I'm beat right here. I'm beat, I'm leaning. And it looks like he's trying to get on the hip but he's not running his feet is he's basically pivoting around his left foot and hoping he's able to push 17 just far enough back 
that maybe K can step up. So right here, if he would have engaged his feet and tried to turn it into a run block, he would have had a better chance of of uh, not giving up the sack than basically just opening up the gate and pushing him and watching him run run around and hitting your quarterback. Yeah, and this is, I mean, you look at the number of yards, right? And that's usually a, like what I'm looking at is like, okay, you got four yards here. This is this is seven yards, seven, eight yards for 17 to essentially come unimpeded, right? Like he, right. he, he's gotten this clear path. He, did, he wasn't really rerouted there. And if you can do that at maybe nine, nine to 10 yards, then that's reasonable to expect your quarterback right. to be able to step up. But this is, I mean, you know, where Cade McNamara is on his drop, this is, he still has ground to gain, you know, like he still has two yards um, where McNamara, there's no reasonable expectation that he'd be able to step up. Um, and that's just not enough depth. Yeah. So it, it, seeing the lack of foot movement, it's, like his footwork it, it, there. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lack of technique all the way around. Yeah. But then the part that's really disappointing to me is right here where he doesn't start running his feet. Mm. If I beat, you got to turn it into a run block at this point and hope for the best. Maybe Cage feels enough of the pressure that he starts to step up. Right. But, you know, obviously this is our end result. Um, kudos to the right side of the line. You know, they're there. They're given a decent enough pocket, even though it's, you know, it's just a three-man rush. But the right guard and the right tackle, one-on-one pass pro, holding their own, doing doing a, a fine job, setting their back foot, finding their anchor, having their hands inside. Uh, 65 is a little high for my liking, but, hey, good enough job. And this is why I talk about playing offensive line is literally the team within the team. If you look at almost every other position, on a football field, even with the defensive linemen and, and, you know, if they're running stunts and whatnot, typically, you know, it's still their movement. I'm just working in concert with someone else. But as an offensive lineman, we have such a symbiotic relationship that if I got four guys doing their thing and one guy does it, this is, this is what happens, right? You are now the weakest link in that chain. And, that's the one thing about this particular offensive line that has been driving me nuts all year is that as individuals, yes, I think we have good offensive linemen. Um, as a unit, yes, we have done some good things. And that's the scary part is the fact that we can do it. We do have the horses to do it, but we lack the overall consistency, game in, game out, play in, play out, to really be one of what I would consider – an elite offensive line across the board. Yeah, and I think Kate McNamara does do a good job making the offensive line uh, look pretty good overall because he's only taken, I think, five or five sacks this entire season, which is a really good metric. He generally has a pretty solid pocket presence, can get rid of the ball when he needs to, and a lot of those things help you know set your offense up well and not get into these third and long situations as much because he's able to uh, take care of the ball, throw it away when there is pressure, and not make, um, you know, not not make a, a bad pass rush into a worse issue lingering within right. the offense. So I think I think you're right. There are a lot of things to clean up. At a certain level, though, Penn State does have some some really solid defensive ends. Probably some of the best that Michigan will see uh, between number 17 and 40 here. Both really really good players that um, could contend with anybody as some of the best pass rushing defensive ends in the uh, in the country. So. You know, you're you're unfortunate that you lost this one, right? Michigan forced right. three fumbles, uh, three strip sacks, and and only had one uh, done to them. And they, you know, don't recover any of the three their defense produces and lose the one that their offense gives up. So a little bit of that is unfortunate. But um, like you said, there there are think you you can't make one mistake into such a huge play, and and this turned into three points and the lead for Penn State at the end of the game just can't have it. Exactly. And, you know, and let's talk about the collateral damage here. So right there, when you looked at that, and especially coming from the quarterback's blind side, um, obviously you don't want to get your quarterback hit. Right. But because at this particular point, everything's happening on everybody else and everybody else's blind side. When you watch the right tackle 
basically get rolled up by the quarterback and, and the defender. Yeah. You know, these these are the things that a lot of people don't necessarily take note of because, oh, well, it's the sack, it's the quarterback, you know, it's that guy that got hit. But oftentimes than not, I've seen a lot of this happen as an offensive lineman where you're blocking and you're doing your thing. And the next thing you know, you have all this action happening behind you. And this and this is where that unexpected injury comes from because you have no way to prepare or brace yourself for this. Right. So Yeah, that right you leg. Know, you, you, I mean, yeah, you could very you know, easily see that. Yeah. yeah, for a few seconds. So it's uh, it's imperative that, you know, the five guys up front have a high level of trust in each other and have a high level of expectations of each other. And I've, you know, said it time and time again, that playing offensive line, I was more afraid of my line mates than my coaches. And it was, that was the level that we held each other to. Sure. And, you know, we are going to be a strong unit and you did not want to be that weak link in that chain. So, you know, that's the level of expectation. I hope that's taking place in the offensive line room when you got these five guys and, you know, the other guys that are coming in and getting some quality time. If, if, if it's your time to step up, we need for you to honor the position and play, play for the guy that's next to you. And that's more, I don't want to say it's more important, but I, I think it's more prominent um, within the offensive line because we're literally playing next to each other. Right. And there's there's a higher level of, of intimacy, if you will, because of all the things that we have to do in concert in order to orchestrate this symphony of violence. Right. Yeah, well put. All right. Thank you, Thomas Gwines, for joining me on the Maze and Blue Review. You can find this obviously at the maze and blue review.com or michigan.rivals.com throw a subscription to the youtube channel we just reached over 500 subscribers lots more content like this to come out adding a new element here to uh, the analysis so appreciate you thomas Gwines, for joining um any final words uh from this game um definitely from this game like i said before the resiliency that was shown we got down um, late in the game, us being able to come back, get that big score um, from all um, that was out there playing hurt with the uh, high ankle sprain. So that was, you know, very impressive uh, with him, not only playing hurt, but but playing at a high level. Um, and, and like I said, it's just about being in adverse situations, understanding that when it's literally you against the world, it's literally you against the world. Yep. And sometimes there's no there's no better place to play because, you know, only person I can rely on is me and, and the guys I came with. And so I'm happy to see that our guys are, are definitely raising their game, especially on the road. Uh, hopefully we continue to have that as we go into uh, match up against the Turtles of Maryland. And yes, I said Turtles, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, we'll get through that one. And then we'll get to the, uh, the big one on November 27th when we got the team from down south coming into the big house. It's, it's time for us to right the ship. It's time for us to right the wrong that has been taking place for far too many years. We've had too many guys come through Shambackler Hall to say that they have never beaten that team from down south. So I want, uh, hopefully I want these guys, especially these guys that came back, and this is their last hurrah, so to speak, to get that, that bitter taste out of their mouth and that they can, you know, share some war stories with those of us that have had a winning record against the team from down south. So as always, go blue. Thank you for having me on the show. And I definitely look forward to doing more analysis with you on this platform. Can't say any better than that. All right, guys, take care. Have a good one. As always, go blue. Go blue.